The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. We'll get started in about five minutes, so um, hang tight, and we'll allow some more time for other people to get on the call. Thanks. Good afternoon or good morning to wherever you are in uh, North America. Um, my name is Dominic Green. I uh, will get started in a second. Um, I think I see some more people jumping on the call. So um, thank you for joining us for the webinar today. Um, it's hopefully you'll have, um, if you have any questions as we go along, um, there is a question box, um, at the, I think at the bottom of your screen. Um, so if there's any questions, um, I can either hold hold off and um, answer them. We will have a, a portion of time to answer questions at the end, um, as well as, um, as as things pop up along the way and answer questions. So um, this is my first time leading one of these webinars, so I apologize in advance um, if we're having any technical issues, um, but let me know too. Um, like I said, if any questions pop up, feel free to um, chime, chime away. So we'll get rolling. Um, Perfect. So um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I am a 99 graduate of the University of Oregon, uh, joined DU there, um, was a chapter president um, on exec for three plus years and um, was also on IFC when I was there. Um, and so my new role is the director of health and safety initiative. So I am back on DU staff after a 17 year break. Uh, that might be a record, I'm not sure. Um, so I just started August 1st with the fraternity. So I will be responsible for heading up our substance-free housing program and any type of alcohol education, as well as working with our other staff um, around educational programming and other types of health and wellness types of issues. So it could be mental health, sexual assault, um, drug abuse. Um, so anything that kind of affects the health and safety of our members. Um, my background, as I mentioned before, um, I have some undergraduate experience, um, obviously with the fraternity. I also, um, was on staff prior. I was a leadership consultant and director of expansion um, before I went back to grad school. Um, so I had did 15 years on college campuses. So I worked at the University of Washington, Northwestern University, um, and American University. And most recently, I was on staff with the North American Interfraternity Conference, then IC. So um, as the campus operations vice president for the East Coast. So I had North Carolina to Maine. So that is my background and experience. Um, I'm excited to work with the fraternity. It's been great the last couple months being back on staff, but I wanted specifically to go into uh, what we've learned so far, what the policy is around substance-free housing, um, and where we really could use your help, um, and, and specifically, and also some observations that I've seen in the last two months on the road. So I will get rolling into the presentation. We have a lot to cover, um, so like I said, feel free if you have any questions to um, chime away in the box as we go along. So here we are now with this announcement. Um, as you can see here, the fraternity board announced this um, in May. Um, so after a significant amount of research, um, looking at our peer groups, um, as well as just looking at recent trends. We'll go into that in a, little bit in a second. Um, we conducted substance-free housing forums at, at LI this summer in Scottsdale, as well as I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings from uh, with our current undergraduates. Um, we did hire a new staff member, that's me, um, to help with this implementation. So uh, the fraternity determined that it was a need to have some a full-time staff member really help work with chapters and alumni groups to really focus on this part of um, our new policy implementation. Um, so since then, um, since what I've been doing is learning from our existing and currently existing chapters who already are substance free. So just let you know, we have a, we had 11 groups going into this fall that had already been um, substance free. Um, we had eight early adopters um, and then we're also working with our other chapters. So 
in total, we had 51 groups that have some type of facility within the organization. So um, with that being said, so there's clearly the biggest chunk of our groups are the groups that will have two years to really look at the policy. How can they can work with the policy? How can they best start implementing the policy for their chapters? So why are we going in this direction? For some of you, this might be a repeat. We covered this in a lot of um, slides and we covered a lot of this, this information at Leadership Institute this summer. But uh, fraternities are in a time of transition. Uh, we want to be make sure that we're um, that we are going to be relevant as well as sustainable moving forward. Um, I think in my experience as an IC staff member, um, working for an IC in 2017 when we had four high profile deaths across the country and um, fraternities really being in a, in a boiling pot of water of universities having really almost zero tolerance. I know in my prior experience when I worked at Northwestern, we might have given a chapter you know, five, six, seven, eight times to potentially screw up before we really drop the hammer. Um, and I know a lot of universities are having one incident and, you know, and, and it is a severe, severe uh, sanction uh, hammer, um, especially over the years, you know, DU has lost a few very large high profile chapters in, in, in our organization. So we're really looking at the health and safety of our guests and realizing that as you see some of the statistics on the screen, um, that a good chunk of the men who are living in our facilities, 80 to 90% of them are under the age of 21. Um, most of our losses, nearly all of them, uh, had to do with some kind of alcohol. And, and, and quite frankly, a lot of people ask me this question, especially with my NIC experience and 15 years of working at a university. I do think that more and more universities are going to move this direction and more national organizations are going to move in this direction. In a second, I'll, I'll talk about our peer institutions that were peer organizations that we're working with, excuse me, but where there's also a lot of discussion where universities are continuing to kind of restrict and constrict what is being allowed, what is not allowed. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised in at least even in two years or in five years, this is going to be more of a trend that we're, we're going to be leaning towards. So here's our definition of substance free housing. Um, I won't necessarily read it word for word, but um, obviously any type of substances within the facility. So this could be alcohol, drugs, um, tobacco, marijuana specifically, um, regardless of state um, or local laws and control substances. So really what it, what it means for us is not having it in the actual chapter facility. Um, so that is something that um, our chapter, for a lot of our chapters are wrapping their heads around. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of chapters are caring about certain areas of this uh, definition more so than others, but this is where, how we're working through, we're working, this is our working definition of substance free housing. So really what it means though, substance free housing means a dry facility, but not a dry fraternity. We've heard a lot of feedback recently, especially from some alumni that this means in, in terms that we're gonna turn that fraternity dry, which is not the case whatsoever. Um, we really just want to make sure that we're moving a lot of these high risk, high profile events out of the facilities. Um, you know, and I, in my experience, both as a, working for the fraternity universities, you know, some of these, depending on the size of your facility, are having 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600 plus people in your facilities and the wear and tear in the facilities and the type of risk that our chapters are willing to take on because they have the space to do it. Um, it is pretty concerning and, and, and pretty scary, honestly, at, at times as well. So we're really wanting them to shift the larger scale events out of their facilities um, and rethink how they do social events. Because if a chapter is, honestly, if a chapter is being creative, there are multiple different ways, and we'll talk about this in a few, about how they can use their facility once they move the events out of uh, alcohol, the alcohol events out of their facility, but also how can they get more creative about using venues locally and being more prepared um, for that process. So as of just a quick reminder of what the policy looks like. Um, so as of right now, hard alcohol is removed from the chapter facility. So that means any type of event, even if your chapter facility is still quote unquote wet, um, you're anything above alcohol volume of above 15% or 30 proof. Um, just to let you know, we do have a resource on the the DU website that we define to help chapters and alumni kind of to, to shake out what is allowed that's under 15%. So wine, beer, champagne, a lot of things like um, spiked hard liquor or like Smirnoff ice or um, some kind of pre-mixed drinks like watermelon Rita's or even some pre-mixed uh, lower alcohol content margaritas, things like that. Um, all of those things are allowed under 15%. So take a look at that resource on on uh, on the DU website. There's a substance free housing um, specific page that we created that's right on the main web page that'll direct you that we resource. That's been super helpful for chapters to kind of realize that they can do more than just beer and wine. 
Um, like I said, no alcohol, uh, beer, wine allowed in common spaces except for social events. So that is right now really determined if it's universities uh, sanctioned or chapter sponsored, but really keeping it out of the common spaces if there's not some type of event happening in the facilities. Um, and obviously during a social event, we wanna make sure that all the alcohol is staying in common spaces. We we see a lot of high risk behavior when parties start moving upstairs or moving into individual private rooms. So we wanna make sure that everything stays in common spaces. And obviously if you're gonna have hard alcohol, it needs to only be at third party vendors or offsite locations that are um, or attached to some kind of third party vendor. So as of August 1st, 2020, this is when we'll have a complete transition to substance free housing. This removes any, this also means outside of, uh, that means the consumption of alcohol in private bedrooms will be completely removed. So I think there's been a lot of questions about that, um, what that looks like, um, but we will allow um, to have um, three pre-approved alumni events in common areas in the chapter facility or any, you know, it could be in the parking lot, it could be a tent in the, in the backyard, whatever that looks like. So we, um, what that looks like is we are allowing six alumni events. Um, we, the registration process is, is launching very soon. We're just in the beta testing of that process as we speak. So um, we want, like I said, to ha have the ability to have a third party vendor, a caterer come in, so it could be a cash bar um, or, some type of, uh, usually cash bar is the easiest way to do it because you know, our, our policies still say that the even alumni are not allowed to buy alcohol, much like the undergrads aren't supposed to be using alumni funds for alcohol. So and opportunities for different types of events, whether it be homecomings, reunions, founders days, if you have any questions about that, please let us know and we can walk you through what that looks like. But we're gonna have an inform information sheet that walks through the steps of what's needed for an alumni registration um, form, as well as an actual um, electronic form that you all could fill out and go from there. So specifically um, events and third party vendors, um, a lot of questions we've been asked. Um, so if the event starts moving in the house, what does that look like from a loss prevention standpoint? We are, our events will still, we, the, we still expect all events to follow these loss prevention policies. So whatever that looks like, that means that you are not following the, your, excuse me, you're following the guidelines of all our policies. You know, we use the, the duck theory if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck. If an, any outsider guest uh, associates that event, whether it be um, at a at an off-campus location, it could be a third-party vendor, uh, could be event space, that it still needs to follow DU policy. So make sure that that um, is is happening. Um, so a lot of third-party vendors, you know, could be bars, restaurants, event spaces. I know when I work in Chicago and DC, a lot of groups use. We're pretty creative about you know they use the zoo, they used. Um, Places that would traditionally maybe weddings um, happen. So it could be some pretty cool uh, estates or some type of art galleries, museums, places that might allow a cash bar at a third party uh, vendor location. Um, I realize that some of your locations are also, you are located in a little more rural location, um, but there are there other spaces in the area. And this is where we wanna really work with um, universities to figure out what other places would allow an organization to rent out their facilities. Um, and, and getting creative, right? So what what can we do? Um, a lot of chapters I've talked to this this fall have talked about maybe having less events, but better events, right? So if we put that put those funds together as opposed to having two or three events a week, maybe we only have two larger scale, better events at better locations um, and use our funds to, um, to uh, rent out spaces and potentially transportation, but being able to have potentially less events, but better events, more fun events, better themes, uh, events that people are going to actually have more fun at. Ooh, excuse me. So what I've been doing since the start of the fall. So just to let you know, um, since I've started, a couple, couple of things we've been going, uh, we've been doing. So one of the things, I'll talk about this in a second, we've done focus groups with uh, two of our higher performing substance-free chapters. Um, I've also been sent on a kind of a listening tour. So I still have a few more visits this fall. And I'm definitely open if you have any, um, if you have any, uh, desire to have me visit the chapter. Um, so at, on these listening tours, I've been meeting with uh, associate members. I've been meeting with the, ch the chapter meeting as a whole, the chapter as a whole, uh, meeting with exec boards, doing one-on-one -on -one meetings with officers. Um, some Most cases meeting with alumni locally or doing phone calls before or after my, my call, um, my visit, excuse me, as well as meeting with the university official on campus. So listening to feedback, suggestions, talking about implementation, talking about what this looks like um, and how can they start really thinking about this in two years. So specifically for the chapters that are 
um, have tiers to figure this out. And I'll talk about that in a few about what does it look like to think about this over the next four semesters and how do we go from here. So some of the things that we've identified from our focus groups, like I said, we mentioned we, we met with two chapters that are have been substance free for a few years. They um, are also high performing, uh, do well in all of our metrics, um, high recruiting chapters, nice facilities as well. Um, but we realized that um, with, with what I mentioned before, that working really looking on what's working. How, how, is, how does recruitment work in these chapters? Well, how are they using their facilities when they're not using them as social events, for just social events? I, the reason why I say that is a couple of the chapters I visited this fall, um, you know, their houses are really just used just for social events. Guys live there and they're social events. And, you know, obviously, and they have meals. Um, but there's not a whole lot of studying going on. There's not a lot of other ways they're using facility for brotherhood events um, or even like non -al or alcohol free social events. So, Example, um, you know, dinner exchanges. Um, one of the chapters I just visited, um, you know, is doing a pumpkin carving with a sorority, um, or they do movie nights. Um, there's still ways that they can still be social. Uh, one of the chapters I've worked with is um, use turn their house into like a miniature golf tournament. So using uh, utilizing the facility and still being social, but just not using it for particular parties. Um, and then and then we also have the ability to. Um, what what are they specifically doing around um, how this how this affects everything with operationally? So we've learned a lot. Um, I don't have final um, details, and we haven't fully flushed out our notes from those visits because they ju they just have happened the last couple of weeks. But um, so far, so good. Uh, the reason why we wanted to visit our high performing chapters was partially is a lot of the fear factor that this would affect recruitment um, drastically, and that the chapter is going to just fall apart if they can't have alcohol in the facility. So really rethinking and, and how do we refocus chapter culture um, around this? Um, I will say this to be full transparency. These two chapters are on campuses where there are already are some other peer organizations that are already doing substance free housing and doing it well. Um, so I bring that up because in a couple of years, we are going to have some other organizations joining us in this effort. So depending on if these groups on your campus or they could be on your campus and coming back, um, there might be some there's going to be some good coalition building to be able to say, hey, this group's doing it well, you know, we can do it as well. We can do it too. Because I think sometimes some of the fear factor is that people just don't believe that it can be done and done well um, and still have a relevant social um, experience. Perfect. So I wanted, I mentioned the coalition building. So the other organizations that we're working with as we right now. So um, we created a partnership um, and we also have so at the end of September, there were eight organizations. We all met up in Cincinnati and had a day long conversation specifically about sharing resources, identifying best practices. Um, we also helped identify what campuses might need some additional assistance. So what campuses can we work with together? If there's you know, strength in numbers, I'm a strong believer in that. If three or four of us are working together to say, hey, we're trying to do this well, trying to work with the university to make sure that we're not on an island um, and, and, and people are trying to use substance free housing against us in the recruitment process. I know that that is a fear factor, but I strongly feel that if we're doing enough things correct um, and showing people what a real fraternity experience looks like, um, I think we can combat the social club, drinking club type of experience that some of our other peer groups on our campuses are doing that just don't seem to quite get that you can still do fraternity well um, and not have social the social experience be the only part of their experience. So. Excuse me, but we're also trying to learn from each other, offering exist, um, additional assistance, and that's been super helpful um, as, as, as far as being able to pick up the phone and calling these other groups, uh, tapping into their current resources. We are fully sharing our resources together, um, and we do, we do have a couple organizations that um, have, are a little bit ahead of us. Um, as you can see on this list here, so the groups on the left are groups that we are already working with. So Phi Delta Theta. And Farmhouse um, went uh, went try years ago. So um, Fidel Tata went Fidel Tata went try in 2000. Farmhouse was I think a little bit after that. Um, and then more, more recently, Beta Theta Pi and Sigma Phi Epsilon announced. So Sigma Phi Epsilon announced summer 2017, and Beta Theta Pi announced in February 2018. So they are both in different stages of implementation. Both Beta and Fidel will be fully substance free by 2020. For both those organizations, a lot of their chapters already are substance free, much like us. Um, they have a. They also had a recent, uh, re specifically with Beta, because of my experience uh, as a volunteer for Beta as well, is that a lot of their chapters, when they um, left campus and came back, that 
the alumni and the national organization agreed to kind of have that group come back as a substance free chapter. So depending on the organization, I realize that on some of your campuses, some of these groups are might not be compliant or might not be the best group to lean on, uh, but it is something that we're hoping that the as coalition building will help with us. The group on the right or other the three other groups that joined us for the conversation as well. Um, that are thinking about it. Fiji has a, a form of substance free housing for some of their chapters, um, as well as SAE and FISI. So I think all large national organizations that are thinking about this, there are a couple other organizations, at least uh, two or three others that we have been in conversations with um, and, and trying to figure out um, that they're thinking about some form of substance free housing in the future. So as I mentioned before, we're thinking in a couple of years, this will, just, this will be much I'd say easier, but it'll be there'll be more of us um, on on certain campuses, um, it, whether the campus forces it or the other groups that are moving in that direction as, as we move forward. So, other thing to bring up as well: um, late late August at the NIC member um, member of meeting meeting of members, excuse my language. Uh, the NIC member groups voted on an alcohol alcohol ban. So, the same that we have already implemented starting August this year. So anything above fifteen percent um, was banned. So that will take full effect um, by next fall. So fall 19. Um, there are some groups that got a waiver because they need to pass this through legislation, as well as our uh, other organizations, our Canadian groups were also given uh, a waiver to be able to figure out because um, some of our some of our uh, organizational peers have a significant number of chapters in Canada. So there are some um, some groups that are working through it, but by fall 2020, there'll be full implementation of this. And I would say probably at least 75 groups will be implementing the hard liquor ban by next fall. Uh, but since then, some campuses have mirrored this policy as well as a lot of local IFCs have literally mirrored the NIC language and passed it at the local level to ban hard liquor from their events, um, from tailgating, from whatever is causing some of the biggest um, pressure points on their campus. As, as we know, hard liquor is what has caused most of the issues, if not all of the issues, uh, nationally, as well as um, even for, for Delta Epsilon as well. So what I've seen, I uh, wanted to talk about just general observations and what I've seen since, uh, and this is uh, actually, I borrowed this from our peers um, at Sigma Phi Epsilon, is where the chapters might be, I'm talking about specific undergrads, it could be some of our alumni members as well, is where they're at in this cycle uh, when, they, when they when they think about substance free housing. So they could be in shock and denial, there could be some anger involved, a lot of resistance, um, and then certain thinking about the next three about, you might accept the policy, realize, you know, in, in my, what I've observed and, and where I've seen a lot of the chapters um, in my in my two months, two months plus on the, on the job so far, a lot of chapters are in the resistance going into acceptance phase of knowing that it's coming. And in and, and a lot of cases, the observations have been like, honestly, this is probably going to happen anyway at the university level. So getting ahead of the game and not waiting until something happens um, is better for us um, and better for the organization. So a lot of chapters that have, as I've worked with um, so far this fall have realized that, you know, they're not happy about it right now, but they're somewhere in, the, in this um, trajectory and what that looks like. You know, so can they start accepting it and start work and start moving? When I talk about trial period would be what things can they start doing or not doing in the facility to then fully have integration, full implementation by fall 2020. So think about your alumni groups, maybe some of your fellow advisors or house core members of where they're at. Um, some of the major comments we've heard from the undergrads this fall is, and some of you might laugh about this, is the fear factor of, well, we're afraid about XYZ alum who comes back with a, you know, with a case of beer in his arms or, you know, with a, with a bottle of Jack Daniels and wants to start drinking in his, in his old room or wants to drink in the living room. So how are we going to combat um, some of the alumni pushback on this? You know, and that's something that as a national, as an international organization, we need to do a better full education about this, but this is where we're going to need all of your help is how can we continue to educate our alumni peers, but also continue to work with our undergrads of, you know, uh, of what this looks like and how they can be really a, a partner in this and not um, a, a roadblock in this and full implementation. So uh, other observations that we've seen so far, um, I'll be honest, I'll talk about this a little bit later, is the current leadership is really not thinking about this, planning for it. Um, in one case, a couple weeks ago, they're like, <laughs> someone literally said, I don't care. I don't have to deal with this. Um, so, so 
I would say almost like punting the problem to the next exec board. Uh, hard liquor has really not been an issue for a lot of campuses, at least I've visited so far. I think they get the hard liquor piece. They realize it's dangerous. I think people are starting to come around that, um, you know, serving mass amounts of jungle juice or, or having top shelf liquor at their parties is not helpful, especially for our guests, um, whether it be freshmen, men or, men or women, or specifically for our sorority friends, that this is not, even though they might be demanding it, they realize that they don't have to be in a space where they are providing it just because the women are per demanding it or almost requiring it for their attendance at their events. Um, I, we've had a lot of questions about tobacco. Um, just to let you know, the, the D board is um, looking at the tobacco policy at our board meeting coming up in the next couple of weeks. So we are looking at the tobacco um, policy piece and looking at potentially removing that from the definition of substance free housing as we speak. Um, like I said, uh, one of the big things as well is I think a lot of our chapters, um, because the announcement came out in May, and maybe they were still processing it, a lot of them did not mention it during the recruitment. So if your chapters already had recruitment, I'm curious if they've already, if they talked about it, did they tell people during the recruitment process? Did you share it after the fact? Um, I, one particular case, I had to spring it on the new guys that were just recruited because the chapter didn't want to tell them. They were kind of waiting for me to get to the chapter. So I would strongly suggest that it's being brought up soon, that the current freshmen are aware of the policy of knowing what they joined and knowing obviously that the chapter still has lots of things going for them, um, but that by come fall 2020, that um, for a lot of them, the current, ex the 2020 exec board will probably will be made up a good chunk of potentially guys who are just recruited, or in some cases, they're not even in the chapter yet. So for some of our deferred recruitment campus chapters um, that you might not have recruited, the guy will be president in fall 2020. So when you think, when you pull back and think about that, is how can you make sure from an advisory standpoint and an alumni standpoint that we're talking to chapters, being transparent, not hiding it, making sure that it's part of the process um, and, and letting people now understand what the policy is and, and also understanding of, of all the other things that, could, that are going to happen and, and what that looks like. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So one of the things, uh, big things for us that we're really working on and want to focus on is how can you focus on first and second year members? Um, the current, I have mentioned this little timeline of the current exec board might not care. Um, the next exec board might prepare or not. It might just punt it to the, the 2020 exec board, the people who will potentially start in January 2020. Um, those are the ones who are the current first or second years. The current first years aren't, might not even be in your organization yet. So how are we spending time with them? How are we focusing efforts and energies on them? Um, how can we... Um, you know, and my, a good idea would be to spend some time and making sure that the advisory team or the, the lead advisor spend some quality time with the associate members right now to walk them through thoughts, feedback, um, you know, what are, what, are their, what are they thinking and how can we make sure that we're retaining these guys, but making sure that guys are joining DU for the right reasons and not just joining just for social reasons, because I think that is where some of the fear factor that some of our chapters have mentioned to me. One of the big things, too, that I've heard from chapters um, when I've, I've weighed out the pros and cons of substance-free housing, I'm not even kidding. In every single case, the advantages have actually outweighed the disadvantages. So the advantages meaning how can they live in a facility, and I'll talk about a little bit later about nicer, cleaner, but thinking about, wow, if the house is actually dry, then perhaps we could actually repurpose some of the spaces in our facility. So how can we actually, thinking about furniture, because in, in some cases, um, you might not have the nicest furniture because you don't trust the guys in the chapter that they're going to destroy something within a year. Um, also, study spaces. How can we create different types of study spaces? So both for individual study, group study, whatever that looks like, and, re, and specifically repurposing social spaces. Um, so this, these are some ideas that I've gotten from some chapters of things I've heard from on the road is, wouldn't it be great if we had some of the, the, the things right here? So specifically media rooms, so you know, projection screen TVs, couches, almost like a, a, a theater type of uh, style. Recreating like rec spaces and expanding those spaces. Uh, specifically nowadays, a lot of men are in a CrossFit and some of that equipment that goes with CrossFit is um, larger pieces of equipment. So what are things that we can do to expand our, maybe our rec spaces if we have a gym in the facility or maybe creating one? Um, what that looks like, rec spaces could also be like ping pong tables, air hockey, pool tables. I've heard a lot of comments like that. Oh, it'd be great if we had a pool table. We don't trust the guys now because I think they'd destroy it or it would get ruined pretty quickly. 
Um, other other things that people have talked about, you know, think about sports bar where you might have five, six TVs around the room with high top seating and guys could kind of just enjoy them. So it could be used for studying, but then also on um, Monday nights, Friday, Saturdays and Sundays for football, um, that that could be a pretty popular way to bring guys together for brotherhood events. Also, a lot of people mentioned just not having adequate study space of different types of study space. So people could study in a dining room, but they could also study maybe in smaller smaller breakout rooms or even like a conference room type of setting where, you know, you could have a, you could actually bring a group, you know, you're doing an engineering project, you can actually bring your group over to the house and actually have group, group projects. I know our, our chapter at Kansas State is putting 2.5 million in their house and they're actually creating some different types of pods and different types of study space. So they might be fine with big open tables, but also people might want some closed off where you can close the door and actually get um, if you need to focus a little bit more. So everyone's going to have a different learning style and, the, and the chapters are are specifically asking for these types of things when thinking about how can you repurpose your party rooms in your basements, or if you have specific social spaces that are really just used mostly for parties, but other than that, they're, it's just an empty space you know, throughout the week. So these are things that some of the advantages of what we've heard, um, and, and you can imagine this is, you know, the chapter's gonna be quieter, House is going to be cleaner, and then guys are going to be prouder of the facility, um, specifically around parents, um, people's uh, partners, um, girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever that might look like, is bringing people over the facility. Um, I was at a chapter house a couple weeks ago who said, one of the members said, like, you know, I brought my dad to the house, but I refused to let my mom come in this building because that's, it, it's just gross. And that was a direct quote from someone I met with a couple weeks ago that, um, that you know, when that house is just used for social events, they don't have... They're, they're, there's not a lot of pride in the facility, therefore they're not willing to take care of the facility, so therefore they don't, they don't take care of the furniture, they don't respect the furniture, they don't respect the, the building. So from what we've heard, and these are the big advantages, that a lot of guys have said that they might be even be more willing to live in longer, so even their junior and maybe even their senior year, if the house was quieter, cleaner, and there's someplace, something that they're proud of. So if that, may, that resonates with anyone, uh, those are some of the things that we've picked up. Um, so far from at least from our um, from the experience um, that, that we've seen. So um, to be helpful in this, um, the fraternity has a CEA and chapter housing account. So some most of your organizations, if you don't have one, um, I will put you in touch with Justin Kirk, um, who's our executive director. Uh, Justin, we have a specific if you're going to be repurposing things for educational uses that those are available for tax deductible gifts. So Justin can walk you through that for either specifically for a housing account or your CEA account that depending on what you want to do the facility. Uh, but those are there are some funds available or you can start some fundraising efforts to be able to repurpose some of your specific facilities in your basement for educational use or even for recreational use, but specifically around the educational use, there are more abilities that there are abilities to use that tax deductible gifts for those upgrades. Um, so if you have more questions about that, feel free to contact me or Justin um, and we can talk to you more about what that could look like um, as well as um, in our research and conversations with our other peer groups, since they've made the announcements so some of the groups who are a little bit ahead of us, they've realized for a, for a good chunk of their, um, their their chapters when they when they discuss substance free housing that they've seen more people willing to step up to the plate and actually come back to volunteering for the organization as well as they've actually seen donations go up when when alumni realize that okay my dollars will actually now go to a building that actually will be taken care of so I can also come back and bring my family um, bring the wife and the kids um, bring my partner and friends to the chapter and be and come back to a place that I'm proud of so we're hearing some of this. This is just very qualitative feedback so far, um, but that's what we're hearing some, from some of our peer groups that some people have started coming back to the fold because they realize that they wanna be able to come back and actually be proud of their facility and be willing to invest in their property if they know that it's gonna be going to good use and the, and the chapter is actually gonna be using it correctly. Oops, sorry. Okay, so where do we go from here? So um, I wanted to, well, next thing we're gonna talk about how to, how to best, you, how you best can utilize in working with your officers and your fellow alumni and what you can do moving forward. So one of the approaches that we have found has been helpful so far this fall is talking to chapters about the next four semesters. So how can you start looking at, it's almost taking an event audit of how you currently use your facility and thinking about what is currently in your building and what can you start bringing 
to the facility, but also what can you start phasing out of the facility? So this is a good example. So think about the things you're already using your, your facility for, or maybe you're not because you don't have adequate space spaces or um, furniture or atmosphere to be able to create these things. So a lot, some, a lot of your chapters will have meals, um, brotherhood events, there's obviously studying, athletic events. So there could be uh, things that, you know, if you have a basketball court, you know, some chapters have sand volleyball courts, whatever it might look like. So there might be playing things at the house, you know, at the house, um, or specifically, you know, video games is a big thing, board games, I've heard a few, but video games for some chapters. This went to college last week that they have esports is now becoming a thing. So think intramurals, but think about video game intramurals that you actually play like SAE in some video game, which is, I know sounds funny, but I just realized that that's a thing now, um, as well as also watching athletic events. So um, road games or Monday night football, Thursday night football, whatever that might look like. So I know that that is, um, and some chapters I know have invested in, um, their alumni have been willing to invest in um, DirecTV and or the Red Zone channel, just to be able to encourage guys like, hey, if we're going to create this media room, how can we actually make sure that guys are really going to care about it? And I know Red Zone has been a big selling point I've heard so far this fall. Um, other things. So this is where we talk about event audit. So think about what you're having in the facility and then what can you start phasing out of the facility. So maybe this semester, this, you're going to have, you might start moving some of the current events listing on the screen outside of the building or outside of the facility. When I say prop, I can also say property too, because some chapters will have tailgates on their property. Um, but thinking about registered events that might be registered through IFC or some or through the university, but tailgates, floor parties, and these this might be a smaller social gathering, um, but it's still things that informal things that could happen. Uh, pre games is, is is something we're hearing a lot about, so it might be something with a specific sorority or pre gaming before everyone goes to the bars or pre gaming before everyone goes to like a formal or semi formal um, room parties. Could be you know someone lives in a big room and they have 10, 15 friends over, but it's still a version of a social event in the room. And then also this kind of the spontaneous thing, like, hey guys, it's my birthday, let's bring people over. And, you know, 10 friends turns into 30 friends pretty quickly. So these are the things, and this is where it's trying to have like a real honest conversation with the men in your chapter about how really do you use your facility and what types of events, especially specifically social events, can you start thinking about? And I've worked with a couple chapters that have taken a pretty honest look at everything they do. So from January to December, you know, so they might have traditional like a Christmas party or they might have, you know, they might have specific things around the Kentucky Derby or certain types of events, traditions that they really like having the house. And what are things that they could easily move to somewhere else? So another another property or specifically moving it to um, or just not having in the facility anymore. So starting to think about the next four semesters. Right. So what can we start doing now? What would this look like if we start phasing things out next semester? Really? You know, and thinking about where could what could something what could it look like differently next fall, um, starting so and what this could look, this could also be geographically as well. So not only the events, but where do you have things in the house? So if not allowing alcohol in the third, just using example, if you have three floors, maybe starting next fall the third floor is dry, and then the following year certain parts of facility can be used, or you can only have events in common spaces you're not having events in people's rooms or on floors anymore so how do you geographically start looking at events in the house or how do you start and then also how do you start phasing things out of the facility um i'm i'm a product of when i was chapter president my senior year we made part of our house go substance free and it was actually nice honest i'll be honest it was and i was part of that transition year because the university was forcing us to go substance free so we were we decided to go early. We decided to go uh, go substance for a year early by having half the facility go dry, but the other half we were able to physically do that because of the, how things were structurally laid out, though. But I know some chapters have talked to me about floors. So maybe the third floor is quieter. It's the it's the floor that the older guys live on. Second floor might not. First, second, and first floor might be the younger guys. But at least starting to phase things out of facility might be helpful. So. Um, and as we go along, let me know if you have any questions about any of this. Um, so what we're doing is um, thinking about this is where you all can help us as we move forward. So this is a we've talked about this um, about this. So we want this to have you all be involved, but really have the local chapters being involved in enforcement. Because a lot of the questions this fall have been, well, how are you going to enforce this? How are you going to enforce this? And, and definitely giving me some skeptical funny looks. Uh, so our expectation is, is that 
the local guidelines for how you want to enforce this is really going to be up to you. So the self-governance piece is going to be up to the local chapters. So I'll give some examples. Some chapters have used a strike system. Um, so first strike is a fine. The second time it's it's double. The third time it's it's tripled. And then it's a meeting with the alumni board to talk whether or not you're going to be able to stay in the facility. So I, I will suggest that having large enough consequences to make sure the guys understand that we do need to take this seriously. Um, that making sure what does a consequence look like for someone having a beer in their hand in the hallway versus like someone throwing a raging room party for their birthday um, or a pregame in the house um, and, and giving a big middle finger to the, you know, the exec board, right? So for that one chapter I worked with last week, they actually mentioned that the fines, so the undergraduate fine might be like $50 for the first offense and then it's $100 the next time around. But if you're an exec board member, that's actually doubled. So if an exec board member has an has alcohol in their room, the first offense would actually be a hundred dollar fine, right? So you can imagine there's higher expectations for the exec board, but there's also bigger exec buy-in on how they are enforcing this and willing to enforce it every year, um, and making sure that they're being fair and consistent. So they're not just enforcing the, it on the younger guys; they're enforcing it on their roommates, they're enforcing it guys in their classes, and what that looks like. So that's where I think for a lot of times it's going to be super helpful for you all to be part of that process and where can you help um, working with the chapter specifically on educating the chapter's judicial board and volunteers um, and setting up, like I mentioned, setting up specific consequences for different violations. What does this look like for individual consumption versus them wanting to have an event at the house or, because we understand there are gonna be mistakes, there are gonna be slip ups, so what, what can this look like for you all? Um, Assist the chapter with updating bylaws, specifically address substance free housing and consequences. We're going to be uh, releasing some language to help all of you around what can be put in leases, but also what can be put in bylaws. Um, so we really want and are going to be expecting chapters to look at their bylaws, um, specifically starting next year, um, to be able to make sure that by fall 2020, they're going to have some very clear expectations laid out, um, whether it be house rules, and or the bylaws of so not only how they're going to adjudicate it, but also what are the basic expectations and rules for what will and will not be allowed in the facility. Um, we also, I mentioned before, need your all help is educating your peers and your alumni when you're sending out newsletters, um, when you're putting stuff on the maybe the alumni Facebook group and letting people know that, by the way, guys, like come to the house. We will have an event at the house with a with a third party vendor cash bar, but we're not going to be you can't just show up, you know, you know, with a beer bong and, and think that's going to be cool, right? So I think this is where um, this is where we need all of your help, really helping reinforce this. Because honestly, this is where some of the biggest fear factor, and I'm not just, I'm not, I'm not, I promise I'm not kidding, that some of the biggest fear factor from the undergraduates, at least what they're expressing to me, is they're actually more worried about their alumni than their undergrads because they feel like they can at least adjudicate and hold their their peers accountable. But how are they going to enforce this with a 50 year old and, and his three friends, right? So it's thinking about that and where you all can help us. So things that we are working on right now um, is resources. So we realize that we need to help better prepare our undergraduate chapters so specifically around recruitment. Um, we are developing talking points um, and specific trainings for this. So um, be on the lookout for that at future educational programs. So um, at RLA Leadership Institute, we'll be talking about a President's Academy as well. Um, judicial board trainings, we realize we need to beef up um, infrastructure and trainings and guidelines for how to make sure you actually have a relevant working judicial board. So we'll be working on that as well. Um, um, we we want to develop a loss prevention track at Leadership Institute um, to be able to specifically uh, equip our VP loss preventions with the best training possible. So whether it be bystander intervention, um, we, we're working with um, with, a, with Jason Kilmer, if you see on the, on the right-hand slide, um, Jason is one of the leading alcohol experts in the entire country. He works at the University of Washington. They have some of the most comprehensive and kind of higher end alcohol training programs, specifically called the Alcohol Skills Training Program. So how can we implement some of those programs, but also expand that program for chapters, which, which we'll be working with, with Jason on. Um, we want to be able to roll out a substance free housing guide for chapters and alumni, specifically around lease language and utilizing those accounts, as I mentioned. The alumni event registration process will be launched uh, fairly soon. Also, a lot of other types of resources that we've been developing, we're putting specifically on the substance free housing page on our website. So we'll be pushing some of that stuff out on Friday fast breaks and through other announcements. But as you continue to go back to that website, there is actually now a website specifically designed for this. So 
in your experience, if there's anything on there, they're like, hey, Dominic, we don't, I don't see this. I need help with blank, or how can you help us with this? Um, please let me know, send me an email, um, or we can set up a call to talk about, hey, this is where the chapter is really struggling um, and what that might look like for us. So let me know for sure how we can help. So that is the presentation. Um, any questions for me um, or anything that I can help with? So, um, so um, I, I know there's a question right now um, that I see um, is what is actually a facility? Um, so yeah, no, I'll talk about that. So we're, we're, we are looking at that, um, just to be transparent, um, at our board meeting in a couple of weeks, we are gonna be fully flushing out the definition of property and facility. So um, we realize that we don't want a situation, um, I, I'm leaning towards that the definition of Facility, we're talking about this, that is a substance free. When we talk about housing, it's really going to be substance free property. So, because we don't want guys to have raging parties in the parking lot, tailgating, um, utilizing other parts of, their, uh, of the property and kind of skirting this, um, or just drinking, uh, you know, drinking by the trash cans out back. So, we will, um, that is going to be fully flushed out. I know that's a question, um, but I agree with you that the front of the court parking lot, um, um, so yeah, so we, we are going to be flushing that out. So, apologize for um if that is um we are going to be flushing that out because a lot of um we have been getting a lot of questions about that but we also realize from a lot of our peer groups that um, we do need to flush out the definition of facility um and property um and that is that is coming in the next couple of weeks so we will more to come on that but i am fairly certain that property it's going to be the entire property so thinking about tailgates before a football game or anything like that having raging 600 person parties on your front lawn um, is not going to be allowed. So um, that is something that we would allow some kind of a tent in your parking lot or on your front lawn for like an alumni event, but for undergraduate parties outside, that's still, that's still not going to, that still kind of skirts the policy. Any other questions in the question box? I just saw that one question right now. Um, I will pause for a second, um, but I thank you for that question though. That is definitely more to come. We are definitely um, taking some of the feedback I mentioned before about tobacco, definition of property, definition of event, um, looking at some other questions um, and things that some of our other peer groups are looking at. So um, more to come, um, come probably mid-November or early December um, once we have more ideas. Um, but like I said, a lot of what my job has been is to take this feedback Listen to listen to undergrads and alumni and figure out where we can best help you. Um, like I said, if there is a resource or something that you're just not seeing or something that you're struggling with or something, you know, any fear factors you have, um, here's my contact information. Um, so you can definitely contact me through um, through email. Um, that's probably the easiest way. Um, I'm actually I'm not located or my office is not at. Um, in Indianapolis, I actually work remotely um, from Washington, D.C., so um, I'm on the Eastern Standard Time, but if you want to call IHQ and you can leave, they'll, they'll just send you straight to my phone, so if you would like to contact me for any questions, but also if there's any, if you think that it might be helpful to have some of these conversations face-to-face -face with your new exec boards, um, we have not set the schedule yet for spring 19 yet, so if you feel it might be helpful for a face-to-face -face visit, or to meet with your alumni board or the house board board or just any type of additional assistance that I can help with you all, um, please let me know, I'm here to help. So if I um, do not see any more questions, so if we do not have any more questions, I'll give it a few more minutes. And if not, we appreciate you taking the time and please be in contact and let me know how I can help you do your jobs better, but also where any kind of pain points or areas that we are maybe, or blind spots that we haven't even thought about yet, because um, there are a couple areas since I've even started that we've kind of said, hey, we need to start thinking about that. So besides that, I appreciate it. And thank you and have a great rest of your Wednesday.